Get to the church blind! Get to the church blind! Go! Now! I'm Pete Mitchell, and he's Peyton Jones, and you're listening to Hardcore Church Planning, the companion podcast to the Church Planner Podcast and Church Planner Magazine. Each week, we'll bring you interviews from planners who are in the trenches making it happen right now. These active church planners bear it all, share their successes, their failures, and what they'd wish they'd known when they were first starting out. Listen in to discover how God is working in their church plan. Hey, church planner, here today with an old friend and uh, a guy I knew, gosh, way back, who's got a brand new book out. I'm going to let you tell his story, but he is one of the co-hosts of Drunk Ex-Pastors podcast. Uh, he and Christian Kingry, if I said that right. Uh, yep. Yeah, and and so my guest today is Jason Stellman, and the book that we're going to be talking about today is really a fantastic book. I enjoyed this book immensely. It's called Misfit Faith, Confessions of a Drunk Ex-Pastor. So, Jason, welcome on to the show. Thanks, Peyton. Good to talk to you again after so long, man. It has been long. You know, we uh, we knew each other. This is funny because we were in Huntington Beach. And, uh, I remember you had long blonde hair. You were like, you were the, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny now because we're both bald. I had long hair. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But, you know, we, we both look like someone out of the red hot chili peppers. And then, um, <laughs> I, I remember you were teaching a Bible study on Marina High School campus. And I went along and I was thinking, Hey, I got kids in, in, in the youth group where I was a youth pastor. And I thought, man, I'll go over there. And I remember talking to you in that time. I think you were dating a girl from Australia or something and you were like, Hey man, I'm taking off. I don't remember. I don't remember if that was off to Hungary or whatever, but yeah, it was off to, it was off to Hungary. Yeah. And, uh, and I kind of took over that little group there and, uh, you, you, you kind of, you know, laid the mantle upon me of, of high school lunchtime ministry and, uh, you know, (laughs) I, I well, it was staggered. funny too. I don't know if I don't know if you remember this, but um, you were standing out by my truck, and you looked inside my truck and you saw the book I was reading, which was a second volume of a biography of Martin Lloyd Jones. And you're like, "Dude, I'm reading that same book." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, no way! Like, what are the chances?" And you asked me what part I was on, and we were like literally within a few pages of one another and where we were at in the book. And it's a massive volume. Um, yeah. So it was like it was from that moment. It was like, dude, there's we're connected some in some way right now. It was, it was a trip. Absolutely, and that you know that kind of that kind of went on over the years. So I want to just uh, ask you, and this is going to be an interesting uh, question because we normally start off and we say how how'd you how'd you come to faith, and you go into this into your book. But guys, I got to say, not only are we connected, but Jason's writing style is very much. I'm reading. Big Lebowski in here. I'm reading Star Wars. I'm reading Bono and I'm going, you complete me. This is like, this is like a Jerry Maguire. But, you know, obviously when we say that, we, we react like Batman Lego does to, I don't know if you saw that movie, but he, yeah, he, I did. He watches that movie and laughs hysterically when that line is said. So I mean it like that. I don't mean it in the weird way, but, uh, <laughs> but, but the writing style is fantastic. So, uh, it, you know, t- I know you've got that in the book, which is very important to what you're getting across in Misfit Faith. But uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit of your journey, and it is a fascinating journey. So we we want to sit with you here and buckle our seatbelt and go through all those twists and turns with you. Yeah, well, um, I was born in Huntington Beach Woo-hoo. and grew up. Yeah, grew up <laughs> in Orange County. Um. Kind of a nominally Christian home, I guess. We go to church a couple times a year, but nothing serious. Um, and I started going to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, which is the main Calvary Chapel in that you know kind of network of churches. When I was in high school, and that, that's when my faith really kind of took off. You know, I'd been baptized when I was twelve, but it didn't really take. You know, but when I started going to Calvary, I got really serious about everything and and um you know was kind of immediately this sort of leader guy on the campus and um eventually right after graduation went to Africa as a missionary with two friends for a year and came back 
and I worked on staff at the church for a little while before, and that's when I met you, and then um, took off to go to Hungary as a missionary with Calvary in 94, where I lived until uh, 2000. Um, and the reason I came back is because I had become a Calvinist um, a few years earlier, and that's like the unpardonable sin uh, in Calvary. Sorry, that was the yeah. family guy reaction yeah. to uh... – <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, I moved home to the U.S. in 2000 uh, and went to seminary uh, in uh, Westminster Seminary in San Diego, um, where I graduated in '04, and that's when I moved up to the Seattle area where I now live to plant um, Exile Presbyterian Church, and I, I was pastoring Exile um, happily, never had a thought in my head of doing anything else. Um, but in 2008, I stumbled across um, an article about um, sola scriptura, the idea that scripture alone is our uh, sole source of special revelation. And it was written by a guy who used to be a Presbyterian and who's now a Catholic, and he was critiquing that idea. And it, you know, at the time, I was very much not okay with loose ends anywhere in my thinking, you know, anywhere in my theology. Everything had to be buttoned up tight and tucked in and perfect. And so it really bothered me, you know, that I couldn't answer this guy's challenges to the idea of Scripture being our only authority. And that one thing led to another, and, and four years of wrestling with Catholic stuff from 2008 to 2012, uh, I literally did nothing else but wrestle through issues concerning the Bible and the church and authority and justification and faith and works and all this stuff. Uh, and I finally couldn't, I, I, just, I lost, you know, I, I fought and lost that battle. And so in, in 2012, I stepped down from my ministry and uh, became Catholic that year. And, you know, what's funny, and this gets into the book, is that, you know, I thought that I would just be a Catholic version of my old Protestant self. You know, I, I thought I'd just be this apologist for Rome and kind of, you know, do in a Catholic context something similar to what I had done before as a pastor. Um, but what I noticed was that, you know, journey, like enter, entering into that Catholic context was just like the beginning, not the end uh, of this journey. Because I've noticed in my own life, and I share about this a lot in the book, um, I lost that sort of bloodlust, you know, for theological debate. I lost that desire to prove myself right and prove others wrong and defend my views against those who would oppose them. Like all that stuff that drove me um, as a Protestant just melted away. It was weird. It just left. And I literally didn't care and still don't care anymore <laughs> um, if people mm. like what I'm saying or if they agree or if they have if they have objections. I don't feel like I just need to run around answering them all the time. Um, it's been a weird, <laughs> you know, this kind of ideological, theological shift in me gave way to this way bigger existential shift in me to where I actually wrote a whole different version of Misfit Faith, uh, had a different title. It was a completed manuscript that I submitted, and it was so polemical and so argumentative and and, and defend, defending myself and all this, and I, I hated it. I asked my publisher, like, can I just not, can we not, <laughs> you know, and can I start over and they actually said yes. You know, if you if you don't like it, then start start over, and that's what misfit faith resulted from. Which is really rare. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into it at that at that stage. So that is that is rocking. I remember reading that in your book and going, "Wow, I've I've read your book almost twice. I took it on an airplane. Could not. This book is a cannot put down book. I mean, it is that well written. And then as I was reading it, I tucked it in. Uh, cause I put it down and I stuck it in the, uh, the little, what do you call that thing? Like the little folder that they give you on the front of someone's chair in front of yeah, you. Yeah. Where they stick the magazines in the barf bag and stuff. So it was left on an airplane and all I could think of was a, I feel bad cause I left Jason's book on there and B is it kept going through my head. That video, uh, learning to fly by the Foo Fighters that two, uh, air airline yeah. stewards are going to find it, get high and read it. And get converted. And that was kind of my uh, secret hope. <laughs> hey, you, you never know. You, you never, know. never know. But 
but you know, the funny thing is, Jay, hearing your story, I don't know if you felt this because you and I kind of followed a, a similar uh, journey. I got a little blackballed, um, not quite like you. Didn't get kicked out while I was on the mission field, but um, but I, I remember looking back years later when I blew out the other side of of, of being a hardcore. Uh, Calvinist, I remember just becoming, I, I told you before the interview, I'm, I'm like Frank and Christian now, um, where, you know, little bits of me sewn together from, from the different places I've been. Um, but, but I remember kind of thinking my timing is really bad because right about the time I stopped being reformed, reform stuff was the hotness. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was reformed, yeah. it was the devil. And I just remember thinking, man, my timing is really, really bad. <laughs> but uh yeah so, you you ruined it dude it was awesome it was awesome and then like you know you you uh became calvinist and it just like blew it yeah i blew it for everybody <laughs> didn't i <laughs> i started causing waves no it, it's funny man because um i just remember at the time thinking if my timing were better if i had gotten that backwards it would have been you know i could have people could have liked me darn it but i think one of the one of the great things that you bring up in this um, is that, that humility. And I think that is so important to where not only, you know, people outside of the church, but people within the church, where I think within the church, even people are getting tired. You, you mentioned being super polemical. Talk about the humility that developed, um, in you. Cause you and I aren't naturally humble guys, right? I mean, that's fair to say, right? We're not known. Yeah, that's true. You know? So t- tell me a little bit about that, because that, that really kind of permeates the book. And I, I don't know the book that was, but I can I know the book I read and it was refreshing. Um, w- what was that journey like that God took you on? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's a sense in which a powerful sense in which the sort of self-understanding of your church, your de- denomination, your group that you're affiliated with is going to affect your own self-identity as an individual. So when I was a Protestant, and especially when I was a Presbyterian, um, you know, we understood ourselves to be the antidote to the Roman, you know, heresy. Um, And when your whole, the whole existence of your church uh, is a response to some prior problem, then it affects you as a person. And so I felt like it was my right and my duty to run around and argue with people and try to convince them, uh, you know, to be Presbyterian and to accept John Calvin into their heart and and all this, all this stuff. Um, But when I became Catholic, you know, the, the, the Catholic understanding, the Catholic church's understanding of itself um, is, is completely different than, than any denomination thinks about itself. A lot of times, like, you know, like, uh, Episcopalians or Baptists or Lutherans or Methodists think of Catholics as just another denomination among the pantheon of like options out there in the free market. But the, you know, the Catholic church kind of doesn't look at itself that way at all. It doesn't look at itself as, um, you know, needing to, needing an enemy or a foil to justify its own existence. It's more like, ah, we, we're, we've just always been here and we're always going to be here. And, you know, if all of our, our enemies somehow disappear tomorrow. It's not going to change anything, you know, because um, they because they don't exist. They don't see themselves as existing um, to fix some prior problem. And so, kind of that sort of started to seep into me, you know, kind of got baked into my bones a little bit. And when it did, it, it sort of took away the urgency that I used to feel to make sure all of my doctrinal T's were crossed and I's dotted, you know? And I talk about in the book, there, there's kind of like this audacious and ironic humility, you know, because the claim of the Catholic Church, and trust me, I'm not a good Catholic. We were talking about this before we went on the air. It's like, I suck <laughs> at being Catholic, um, and I'm okay with that. Sometimes I think the best kind of Catholic is the bad kind. Um, uh <laughs> But the claim of the church is um, so audacious, you know, that we we're, we're just the church that's always been here, and uh, the denominations are things that broke off from us at some point, point. Um, and they come and go. But we're just always going to be here because the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. It's a very audacious claim, you know. Yeah. Um, but it actually, ironically, produced at least in me, uh, uh, you know, a humility that I'm still 
growing and I'm still trying to learn, but um, it, it definitely produced um, a tolerance for um, everyone else because I wasn't very tolerant before. And um, being Catholic, oddly, has made me just perfectly okay with other people having different perspectives and other people seeing things differently, perhaps other people thinking that I'm wrong. Um, that's, that's okay with me. You know, yeah. I say at the end of the intro of the book, you know, I can, I, I can list off, off by name, like at least a hundred people right off the top of my head who are going to hate this book. But part of the liberty of not being in the ministry and being an, an official spokesperson of Jesus anymore is that I don't <laughs> give a toss who agrees with me and who doesn't. So there, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and so that's, that's, you know, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and you were very much, I mean, you were, your role within the presbytery was kind of like the theology police, you know? I mean, you were almost, I don't know if there's a word for it, but was it like a, a prosecutor? If someone went far off of the, the, the reform soteriology, you went and got him, you know, you're, you're a bit of a bulldog. And, uh, and you're, you're also, I will say this on your behalf. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not proud of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think what's interesting is that to watch your shift and it's not you're an intelligent dude like it's not like you're just you know you're just this easily you're a critical thinker anyone who listens to drunk ex pastors I mean I listen to that and I think I could not keep up with you two in a room in conversation you guys are you're intelligent and uh and and now if I had if the only thing I knew of you was the uh, video of people tripping over the step in Barcelona. <laughs> One of my yeah. favorite YouTube clips ever, I have to say. But uh, but uh, you need to Google that. How do they find that, Jason? <laughs> um, I, I think if you if you go on YouTube and type in Barcelona trips, maybe that'll help you find it. Christian and I were sitting out in this this plaza in Barcelona like a few years ago and there's this little step and everyone who would walk into the plaza would, would not know it's there. And so they'd step down and, and like flip out and like, Oh, and almost fall. And Christian got like five minutes of video of it. And I'm just in the foreground, just laughing my ass off at all these people. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> so, and, and here's, here's kind of where I'm going with this, you know, for our church planners, they are constantly, and I think church planners tend to, you kind of develop this because you're always talking to people, particularly the church planners. I think our audience caters to, which is uh, not your big box church plant launches, but more of your guys are going to go into a community, settle in there, become a part of that community, appreciate it, learn as much from it, you know, have, have that kind of humble stance that they have to learn to listen to people a lot. And, and that's one of the values, I think of what you've brought to the table with you and Christian. Christian is an ex-pastor. He was an ex, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't know Christian, but uh, wasn't he a missionary pastor also in Hungary at the same time? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and so now he is an atheist, and the conversation— He's an agnostic. Agnostic, sorry. And, and, and your conversations together, to me— have immense value just listening to you to talk because you often talk about, uh, you know, Christianity or just, you know, world events and, and a whole host of things and Bieber. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is to me very enlightening to hear that and to watch that you yourself still believe with your best friend who does not. And I just think that, that that kind of, ability to listen is is one of the reasons again that I have you on here because I respect you and it's easy to dismiss somebody when they make a change that uh maybe you yourself haven't made but when someone you respect does so you you listen to them and say oh wow you know that's interesting yeah thank you and um one of the things too is that you know, until you, until a person has um, done an about face with regard to some belief that he or she has had that they no longer have, like until you've changed your mind, um, it's easy to you know hold on to all of your beliefs with such a tight grip because you've never been challenged and never had to you know rethink anything or admit you may have been mistaken. Mm. But once once you do. Um, change your mind about something significant, what I think that ought to do and what it's done for me 
is make me hold all the other beliefs I still maintain with a looser grip because I now yeah. I know what it's like to have not thought it through or not maybe emphasize things correctly. And so it's th – there's a line in the book where I say the, the um, beautiful thing about being wrong is it frees you up to do it again. And mm. um, there's something about you know having – especially in, in my case because – you know, stepping down from the Presbyterian Church was like a public thing, and it was a real yeah. big, you know, scandal or whatever. People were super pissed off and everything. Um, so it, it was it was done in the public eye. And but the nice thing about it is that um, I realize, you know, the provisional nature of all the other things. I think, you know, yeah. And so, uh, I, you know, if if I was holding on to this idea so tightly, but then I've let it go. Then I think, you know, wisdom dictates that you hold the other things that you maintain with a looser grip, knowing that you've been wrong before yes. and it could happen again. And you can see it as um, a step along the way, uh, 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 an opportunity for humility, um, rather than being so threatened and so scared of being challenged, which is how I used to be. Uh, now I welcome it because it's like, well, the cat's out of the bag. I don't know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> bring it on, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of peer pressure in, in the circles you guys have, you know, uh, you and I have come out of, but here's the interesting thing. I was yeah. never a Presbyterian, but I was overseas at, you know, in Lloyd Jones's circle, which, you know, they, they would call themselves Welsh Calvinistic Methodists. But, uh, mm -hmm. but, but the interesting thing is, is that, um, I can remember first coming to faith, very similar. And that's really well said. I, I remember coming to faith and I, I picked up Revelation, like, you know, like you do. I'm reading through Revelation. And it clearly looked to me one way. And then I started listening to Christian radio. And all the preachers were telling me, hey, there's this pre-trib rapture and this is going to happen. And I remember going, huh, okay, I'll believe that then. Because these guys know better than me. And uh, and I believe this <laughs> whole system, which what really got me in trouble uh, in the in the early days um, when I started wasn't so much – Reform theology, because I remember talking with uh, Chuck Smith, who is a you know great guy. I mean, amazing dude. And you know, just chatting with him and said, "Hey, um, I'm more Calvinistic." And Chuck just laughed and said, "Hey, you know, if I read Spurgeon, I'm, I'm I, I actually told him I was a Calvinist." And he said, "If I read Spurgeon, I'm uh, I lean that way. But if if I read Parker, I lean more Arminian." And he goes, "Just depends." And he goes, "I would just suggest you read a balance of people." which I thought was pretty good advice. And he was really cool about it. And then I go, oh, yeah, one other thing. <laughs> uh, I believe that we're going to go through the tribulation. And he goes, yeah, that's a distinctive. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess I'm out. And uh, uh, yeah, so, It's all fun and games until you uh, get your eschatology wrong. That's right. And, and, and what was funny, man, is like, I went through that same thing, but I, then as you mentioned in the book, you, you, you actually say at one stage, I exchanged one dogma for another. And I, it, it's kind of like that, that one, two punch perhaps that when you go through the second time, um, because then later years, years after I had a very similar experience and I, I came out of the backside. Now I had, I had had my teeth stomped out, uh, by, by, you know, uh, a nasty church situation and was like, I'm done. I quit. You know, God, you're okay. I'm mad at you, but hate your people and ended up accidentally church planning in a Starbucks. But my relationship was trashed and it was the greatest favor God ever did me because prior to that, I was like the reform poster child, you know, I was like mm -hmm. the protege mm -hmm. and, uh, and going, blowing through that exactly the same thing that I've never held a view uh, with, with the same confidence back then, because, you know, you would read only certain authors and only certain authors from certain camps. And you would kind of maybe with, you know, forceps hold something from another camp and read it, maybe to gain an illustration. But there was a suspicion. And I think once you blow through, you think you start reading guys differently, like Lewis, you know, um, I was always told he's not evangelical. So I read him. Now I feel, gosh, the older I get, either I'm a Bonoist, that might be my new denomination, or, <laughs> you know, we, we should start that, Jason. We could start our own denomination. And, uh, here, here I am seducing you out of the Catholic Church right away. Look at that. 
But, Dude, we're going to uh, be rich. We'll, we'll make dozens of dollars. Oh, yeah, man. Royalties, everything. we got our worship sorted already, you know? Mm-hmm. But, yep. uh, but you know, one of the things that, that was so good, and forgive me there, I kind of went on, on, a, on a tangent, but um, what I loved um, was when you started going back to Trinitarian theology as the basis and foundation for everything. And, guys, I got to say, Jason is, like I said, he was an apologist for theology um from from the presbyterian circle this man can argue it but he does do it with star wars lord of the rings and uh <laughs> you too so um it's a fun ride but jason that stuff that stuff was powerful and i mean you really just appeal uh you by starting with the father heart of god do you want to just kind of unpack that a little bit and share with us what what that was like for you yeah i mean i of course, believed in the Trinity before, right? We all did. Um, I took apologetics classes and, you know, was ready to bust out my Trinity verses if a Mormon knocked on my door. That was basically what it was for. The Trinity is for um, hitting Mormons over the head with, right? That's the point of the Trinity is and, to, and J-dubs. you know, Let's defend it. And, and the J-dubs too. Um, you know, but it wasn't, it didn't function in my life in a significant way at all. It was simply a kind of this, you know, idea that uh, every systematic theology book I owned had a chapter on, um, but it didn't really. I didn't think about it. It didn't. It didn't have any effect on my life at all. I, I thought of God more through the lens of a judge. You know that God. You know He made man and gave man His law, and we broke the law and suscepted ourselves to divine retribution and God's, you know, seething anger that, um, you know, he had no choice but to kill Jesus, you know, to get that off his chest so he could save us and acquit us in the courtroom of heaven with that, you know, forensic declaration of not guilty. Um, That was my paradigm, right? It was very much legal, very, very um, God is the lawgiver and judge. Um, but in the book, I talk about how that you know you can't you can't even dabble in in Catholicism or Catholic thought or even dip your toe uh, into the Tiber, you know, without there being this massive emphasis on the Trinity, the Fatherhood of God, and the incarnation of the Son of God. And I started to look at God as a Father, and coupled with this idea that I unpack in the book about grace perfecting nature. Uh, about the fact that, you know, when heaven and earth, um, you know, intersect, uh, heaven's job is not to stamp earth out or say to earth everything you, you, you know is wrong. Um, that's not what Christ did when Christ assumed human nature together with his divine nature. He didn't commandeer human nature or uh, do violence to it or take it over uh, like a zombie when somebody gets bitten by a zombie and they become a zombie and they cease to have any kind of, you know, individuality or humanity left to them. Sometimes I think we th- uh, think of the relationship of heaven to earth that way. Mm. Um, that's why there's such a thing as, as Christian music and Christian Christian radio, because we can't you know, ever listen to regular music. We have to listen to some baptized version of it because heaven and earth are at war, right? Right. So when I, when I started to think more about the relationship of, of you know, the divinity to humanity and the Trinity and the fatherhood of God— um, and, and st- started to wrestle with this idea that God might be a better father than I am. Mm. Um, <laughs> that it, it, it just transformed maybe. Just the maybe. way, maybe I'm there. see, I like, I don't torture my own children for the smallest infraction of my law. And if God is a father and a better father than me, then maybe he doesn't do that either. And maybe that's, Looking at him that way is perhaps not looking at him through the proper Trinitarian lens. Um, so, you know, seeing him as a father and seeing him as a better father than I am transformed not just the way I think about him, but the way I think about myself. Because if I'm a, if I'm a son of God and I'm a part of this divine family that God has been eternally fathering, and which includes people from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation – um, then it makes no sense for me to run around getting involved in a bunch of sibling rivalries. 
you know, um, fighting with my brothers and sisters over, over, over things. Um, you know, that, that is not what God wants. That's what no parent wants to see their children's, you know, at war. And I also cease to really function according to this paradigm of guilt and condemnation, you know, because guilt and condemnation are very legal concepts and there's something to be said for those concepts biblically. Um, but we can't reduce God to the forensic and we can't reduce our relationship with him to the legal. Um, and in my former life as a Presbyterian, it was all about law. I mean, we mm-hmm. would literally say like at the end of the day, it's all about law. It's about God as lawgiver, yeah. man as lawbreaker, Christ as law keeper. Right. Um, but it's like that, the, where's the Trinity in all of that? You yeah. know, where's the fatherhood of God in all of that? That became my stepping off point for everything else. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the fatherhood of God and the incarnation of the son is a pretty good place to start, you know? It's a great place to start. And here's the deal is you, you, you just, you know, again, just commendation for the book. Um, guys, you, you know me. If I don't think the book's that great, I'm not going to have Jay on here. Um, it was a good book. And, and, and here's the deal is not only does he start out there, but he walks you through it. And if I can say this, I, I remember reading this and I had gotten to that part on the plane. Like I said, it was a couldn't put me down book, but when I did put it down, I lost it. So, um, <laughs> but I got it back. They sent me a new one within like two days, man. They were on it. So I got that copy finished reading. But it, can I say that you actually probably were more gospel as a Catholic than you were Presbyterian? You painted a picture of the relationship with God that was truly, truly good news. And I, and coming from, from Presbyterianism, you know what I mean by that. And it, it really came across, man. I, I really was like, wow, this is, this is gospel. This is pure gospel. And it's not from the same theological construct. The systematic theology Jason once held was dismantled. But I felt like the gospel came through more powerfully than than just about I'd ever read, man. So, well, thank you. I mean, that means a lot. You know, um, a lot of it was just born out of <clears throat> spiritual crisis and necessity. You know, because it's like the vestiges of my old life were just kind of you know being ripped off, and it was all crumbling around me. And it, I got to a point where it's like, look. Um, it, it just ha- has to be about grace. And if it's not about grace, then I'm screwed and there's no point. And so um, I am just going to, you know, think from this perspective of self-preservation. Like God just has to be this way. You know, mm-hmm. he just has to be. He and if to. I'm wrong and – but if I'm wrong and he's a judge, then I'm I'm screwed. You know, there, I'm, I'm without hope. But um, – if he's a father, then I'm just going to act like a child before him and <laughs> treat him this way, because otherwise I don't. I'm I've I've kind of got enough mistakes in my rearview mirror to not think that I'm going to score any holiness points ever. So um, you know, so a lot of it was just me riding out of desperation. Like I, I yeah. just have to relate to God this way, and if yeah. if this is not the right way, then oh well. But you know, I'm I'm gonna if I strike out, at least I'm going to swing and not. <laughs> you know, get called out on strikes. Well, you, you know, know, it's cool, man. She's a baseball illustration. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know anything about baseball. So that one went over my head. Oh, no <laughs> pun intended. No pun <laughs> delivered. But, uh, but here's the deal. Um, you know, reading through that, this is one of the things I loved about the picture you painted of Catholics. And I think Catholicism has always done this well. And I think I do it particularly well in my private life, although I may not always want to admit it publicly. But it's this idea that we're giant screw ups. That's just what we are. And in any, any theology that doesn't cater to the reality of <laughs> a, what you read all throughout the pages of scripture, everybody's a screw up in scripture. No matter how you boil it down, they're all screw ups. And at the end of the day, I am because I know me. My wife gets a glimpse of what a big screw up I am. But, uh, but I know me and I know me better than anyone. And I know me. You know, just about any walk, and there's always this idea that, you know, maybe I'm just alone. And everybody feels that because everybody's a screw up. And, mm. uh, and you really bring that. And I think what, what's refreshing about Catholicism is they're just really open about it. 
<laughs> yeah, we're all screw ups. What were you thinking? And, uh, and you bring that out in the book in a unique sort of way with, with Jason Stellman skin on. But, um, brother, hey, we're running out of time here because this is a 30 minute podcast. Unlike drunk ex pastors, oh. which, uh, kind of <laughs> tends to, that, that's like a marathon, isn't it? It's like, it's a big one, but it's enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, it's like over 90 minutes is a short one for us, but you know, <laughs> to each their own. Well, you know what? This this is the deal, man. I have a long one. We do 30 minutes of banter called Smack Talk. And uh it gets long sometimes, so I relate. And I'm, I'm when I got someone else on here, it's fun to do, but you know, sometimes we get boring guests. There's just no way, you know. If you get past 30, <laughs> you're good and you're at 35 right now, but you know, some guys, you know, nice. it's like 23, we got to shut it down, man. That's, <laughs> but, uh, hey, the, before we, before we do this, the, uh, the book is Misfit Faith, uh, Confessions of a Drunk Ex Pastor. Jason has a podcast called Drunk Ex Pastors. And, uh, is there anywhere else that you would want to send people, Jay, today to, uh, check anything out? Yeah. Um, you can also find me on, at, on the web at jasonstellman.com. Um, and, there are there's information there both about the book as well as I do mentoring you know personal mentoring um, specializing in like you know spiritual issues and crisis and also relationships and all of that and so there's info there about that as well as um, if you want to book me to speak if you've got a group and you're doing a retreat or a conference or whatever you're doing um, there's information at jasonselman.com about booking me to speak as well I'd love to uh, come out and share, just give me a topic and a ticket and I'll be there. Excellent. Excellent. All right. And, uh, Jason, we always ask this question at the end of every podcast and it is, um, we have to, we have to change it up every time, but it's the one that probably our guests really wait for. And it is, and that's my train. So if you ever, if you ever listen to, uh, <laughs> Oh, you, you, of course you did. You watched Mr. Rogers as a kid. They had the trolley. I get the train, and that signals us, hey, it's about time to, to leave make-believe land here and go back to you know, okay. wherever children that watch Mr. Rogers come from. But um, but anyways, uh, the question is, if you and Christian, since he's your co-host, were to get in a physical fist fight, who would win? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think he would probably win because I'm – First of all, he ha he has like huge calves, and so um, he'd probably just like steamroll me to the ground. Wow! Because I have zero I have zero leg muscles, and I'm really lazy. <laughs> so um, fighting is just a big pain. So I would I, he would he would probably win for that reason. Even though I'm, I'm a bit taller, and I think I might be a bit stronger, but I'm also super lazy. So it's 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 coin toss, man. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, because then then you're like, I don't know, man. Do I want to go up against those legs or just just take it? You know, just yeah, just it's like lead. it's like it's like softballs that he has on, on, <laughs> underneath his leg skin. <laughs> so it's he's ridiculous. like he's like a, a lower. Lower in Popeye. He doesn't have it in the forearms, but his lower legs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It's crazy. I've yeah. never, never thought about that. So he's kind of like, yeah. he's not pear shaped, but he's like kind of Popeye pear shaped. He's got pear shaped Popeye know. legs. I mean, something like that. Yeah. We, you know, we got to be careful because <laughs> this dude, we don't want to feel the wrath of these calves, man. We got to, we got to be careful. Yeah. He could choke us both out with his, just with his calves. But he's up in Washington, right? So I don't got to worry. No, you're, you're safe. You're okay. safe. All right. Well, cool. Hey, guys, Misfit Faith, Confessions of a Drunk Ex-Pastor. My guest has been Jason Stellman. Jason, want to thank you for coming on today. My pleasure, Peyton. All right, Arnold, sign us out. Remember, if you are called to church planting, go hardcore or go home. You've been listening to Hardcore Church Planting. Hardcore Church Planning has been brought to you by the Church Planner Podcast and the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the App Store for both Apple and Android devices. If you liked this episode, leave us a positive review. If you didn't like this episode, we'll be happy to give you your money back.